Good evening, I'd like to welcome you to our Ash Wednesday service. Normally we have this service at First Church, or it's here, we alternate the times. The, but this time, of course, with everything shut down, so I decided we're gonna have an Ash Wednesday service because we need to have an Ash Wednesday service. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we just come to you now in prayer and ask that your spirit would be with us. And I just pray, Lord, that the message that I would give today would be anointed by you. Use me as your instrument, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. First hymn is number 298, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. <laughs> Uh, please keep um, Joanne Newber in prayer. She's at Elmer Hospital. We'd really appreciate that. Of course, Jimmy Slade and his family. We'd really appreciate that to uh, keep them. Megan, of course, in Cooper Hospital, going to have surgery, so we want to keep her in prayer. Megan has sure shown a lot of courtesy, and I did stop at the house to have prayer with her. So, again, please keep her and her family in prayer. Um, and again, all this going on down south in Texas, it's unbelievable. There are places that homes don't have heating systems because they never have needed a heating system. And now you've got temperature. It was 50 degrees here today, below zero in some place. I think up in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, something like 20 below. So the, the, the climate is all messed up. But um, So let's pray for those who really need prayer at this time. That could be pretty frightening, needing heat and not having a heating system. So. And this last month, uh, I had a, a little lower gas bill than normal, so it's really unbelievable. Pray for our country, that unity would somehow begin to take hold, and I just pray now as we're into the Lenten season, that the time leading up to Easter, that we'd all grow in our walk with Jesus Christ. Lord, we just pray that, uh, again, you would meet the needs of this church. We give them over to you, Lord. No need too great, no need too small. But, oh, Lord, help us to be a people of faith. Let us not let the situation around us discourage us, but may we be encouraged. For all through Christ, all things are possible. Bless us now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn is number 301, <clears throat> Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross. In the cross, in the cross. 
next song. Our text this evening is found in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, reading verses 3 through 5. Daniel 9, 3 through 5. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and we have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and the laws. Let us pray. Lord, I just pray now that you would just speak to us this evening, the message you have placed on my heart. For Lord, you know, these are difficult times. And living the Christian life is not always easy. But oh Lord, now speak to us. In your name we pray. Amen. In John chapter 15, the first six verses, we read these words. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already cleansed because of the word I spoke to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain on the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like the branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Normally, what we would do at the end of the service, we would we always, every year, the tradition of taking and giving ashes and a crown of the cross on the forehead. Those ashes at one time were palm branches. They were used on Palm Sunday. I, I was always fascinated with palm trees. The first time I ever saw a palm tree in my life was at the Marine Corps Air Station in Yuma, Arizona. Later when I was in, in, in Florida, at the Orlando, at the Naval Hospital there on active duty, I remember all the palm trees that were over and how beautiful they were. But a palm tree has to be taken care of and trimmed occasionally. The old palm branches die, they turn dry and brown, and they just hang there at the bottom. You've seen that on trees. They don't just go away, not for a long time. Oh, eventually hurricanes, they'll throw some of them away. But those old branches have to be trimmed. Kind of like our life. At times we have to kind of trim up our lives, you know, so we look, we look really neat. And so what has to happen is you have to climb a ladder and uh, to the, up the palm tree. And uh, these are pretty good size. I guess a pretty good set of clippers or saws, whatever they use. I've never trimmed a palm tree. But they cut away the old branches, and when it's done, it looks really nice. Remember in Southern California, how nice looking up some streets and really nice neighborhoods, and the palms are all cut so nice. A friend and I, like, worked at the Naval Hospital in Orlando, found a flyer in his mailbox. He brought it to work one day. He said, can you believe this? Someone has the audacity to want $50 per tree to trim a palm tree. That's a lot of money. So when he said... I'll do it myself. But after he did a couple of trees and got really tired, he realized by the time the guy came out, all the equipment, $50 wasn't such a bad deal. So he decided to hire somebody because there are a lot of palm trees on his property. It takes time and work to get rid of the dead stuff from the palm tree. And in our lives, we all need some spiritual trimming. I think we would all agree with that when you think about it. Our life is like that. As we grow, we have things in our lives that really shouldn't be there. We pick up some bad habits. Uh, we have things that, just attitudes, actions, things we do. If you look back in the last year, did you do some things you shouldn't have done or did you develop some attitudes you shouldn't do or you, you just weren't very nice to people? But you know what? These things can really hurt our lives. We need to, like I say, get trimmed up occasionally. But it takes time and work to do that. We must put out a, 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 an effort to do that. That's what Ash Wednesday and Lent is all about. Cleansing our lives. Trimming them up spiritually. Get rid of all the dead things in our lives that don't belong anymore. What is in your life that needs a little trimming? Or I should say a spiritual trimming. That needs to be cut away. Lent is a good time to do that sort of trimming. Are there sins or things in your life, in your life, that needs to change or be trimmed. When I was a kid, the big thing when Lent was giving up something. And we always gave up candy. 
Because that was the thing, you know, you kids, you love candy bars. So we would uh, give that up for Lent. My brother and I were talking about that the other night on the phone as it's coming into Lent. And my brother always makes it, goes into fasting. He really takes Lent very serious. Nothing wrong with that. And uh, he said, I just want to do this, uh, you know, and, and, and think about why I'm doing what Christ has done for us. Very good way to look at things. So we, we decide we're going we're gonna to give up this certain thing. I remember my brother and I gave up candy. No candy at all for the entire time of Lent. And then Easter Sunday came. We brought our Easter baskets in the car. So as soon as we got done with church, we immediately started eating candy out of the basket. Which my dad said, can't you guys at least wait till you get home? Or he might say to my, to my mom, Eileen, look what your kids are doing. Anytime we were... Uh, we were bad, that we were her kids. We did something good, he was proud of, we were his kids. That's kind of how it was. So what are some of the things that we need to, to trim in our life, you know? What are some things you could say, well, let's kind of evaluate ourselves here as we begin the Lenten season. Verse number one is pride. It's pride. Do you have the wrong kind of pride? There's a good kind of pride, want to look neat and everything, that's good. I'm not talking about, about healthy pride, one's accomplishments, proud of things our children do, nothing wrong with that. I'm talking about the excessive belief in one's abilities, that in a way we start thinking we're so good, we can do it ourselves. And when we start thinking too much of ourselves, pride or arrogance comes into our life, we tend to leave God out and not depend upon Him. And we really need God's help. Is pride a sin? It's a sin because it means we forget who we are and the need to depend upon God. We constantly have to think about a relationship with Jesus Christ, who we are and who the Lord is. And he's in charge. That's how it has to be. Read in Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 12, these words. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give him a land with large, flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat, and you'll be satisfied. And verse 12 says, Be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You know, it's funny how we can remember some things so well, but we forget about the things that God has done for us. I think as a country today, shame on us. That God has truly blessed this nation, and it's time we get our act together as a country. What do other countries think of us after what happened at the Capitol? One can only wonder. But the Lord brought us to a place. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before the fall. When we think we are so high and mighty and don't need God, we are going to be in big trouble. Our money says, in God we trust. It's time we start trusting God to lead us every step of the way. Is pride what you need to trim your soul? I think we could all take a good look at the term pride. What about envy? That's another good one we might want to look at. Now, by definition, envy is desire for what other people have. We should rejoice when others are successful, rejoice when others enjoy some good fortune. However, how many of you, when you read about the big Powerball lottery, one person won that billion dollars? Did you say, oh, I'm so glad for that person? Or did you say, why couldn't that happen to me? And somehow you're a little bit jealous about that, envy of that. How come I can't have such luck? Well, you know, the odds of winning that are pretty slim. But you know what? There's more important things than money. I'd be curious what's going to happen to that person's life. Especially if everybody knows he has the money. Your best friend grows on a cruise, has a great time, sends you postcards. And what do you think? By golly, I could have a vacation. I think I deserve one more than they do. In Proverbs 4, 3, 4 chapter 4, 14, verse 30, we read, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Boy, that's a pretty bold statement, isn't it? Is envy the sin that needs to be trimmed out of people's lives? We need to remove it because envy is not right. Be content with what you have and what God has given you, for God will supply all your needs. I think the problem with envy is we don't know the difference between a need and a want. We need to make sure of that. And then the third one that we all kind of struggle with, and that is anger. 
Oh boy, I could use some anger management at times too. So easy to get mad about stuff, isn't it? Is it my imagination or does it seem like there's a lot more anger in the world? There's a lot of anger. I think the country's really angry. We have road rage on the highways and then we have people that are rioting and all kinds because they're angry. They say, well, it's because of the virus. Well, yeah, I can see that getting people upset when you don't have money to buy food and groceries and stuff, but we have terrorism all over the world. And you know what? The stuff's going on and the entire planet's in trouble. This is an angry planet. It really is. Politically, our nation is divided between red and blue to the point that's all we hear anymore when we turn the news on. And there's so much anger and bitterness and we're not going to go anywhere until we do that. We've got to unite again. We are called the United States of America. I think there was a Lenten season. We all should all put on sackcloth and ashes and fast a little bit. Maybe we got on our knees and prayed for this nation. Things would change. And I challenge all of us to do that, including yours truly. The world needs to be pruned to these things. I think we have a global epidemic, not only of a virus, but what of a sin nature. The world's in trouble. It needs to be trimmed. The anger needs to go away. James 1, we read this. Everyone should sl be slow to anger. Yeah, one, 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 one. Yeah, James 1, 1. Everyone should be slow to become angry, for one's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Anger has no place in the life of the Christian. Is anger what you need to trim out of your soul? I would hope so. You know, have you ever thought, if anybody has a right to be angry, it's the Lord. To look down on this planet and say, look what those people are doing next. That's horrible. And then the word sloth. Listen among those so-called seven deadly sins. The word sloth. It's not even a very nice word. It's kind of an ugly word. The seven deadly sins we talk about. Sloth is another way of saying laziness. Now laziness. Okay, well let's look at that. We hear the term lazy days, and um, you may think of relaxing. There was a song called Lazy Days uh, back in the 60s. You think about sitting there in the backyard, taking in some sun, or laying on the beach somewhere, going to the, to the ocean, to the, to the beach. So what's wrong with that? God did say rest on the seventh day. Nothing wrong with that. But it seems like when it comes to making money, we can become workaholics. We know how to fill up every minute of our time. When people ask us, will you do this? I'm busy. I don't have time for my family. Um, would you like to join a prayer group? I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to read my Bible. I'm just too busy. It's good to volunteer for community service. I just don't have time. But then when it involves making money, we make time. There's a saying that we always can make time for the things we want to make time for. And that's so very, very true. I don't think work, although some people are out of work, but I think a lot of people work very hard. I don't think we're lazy when it comes to work, but I think we're lazy doing the Lord's work. And that's something we have to be mindful of. Think about that. Should that be trimmed out of your life? I think it probably should be. The next one, fifth one, is greed. It seems that people always want more. There's, they used to say that if all the money in the world were divided up equally, within a short time it'd be all uh, lopsided again. And, and there'd be people that, even though they had millions of bucks, they always want more money. You see that with sports figures, you know? I just can't live on that $20 million a year. I want more or I'll go elsewhere. Greed, it's an awful thing. Because again, we're not grateful for what we do have. We've already got more than we need. You think about it, if all this, in my lifetime, we have more now, more luxuries and modern conveniences than we've ever had. It's amazing the things that we have. But it seems like we always want more. There's never enough. We have a nice home, but then again, when you make a little more money, you want a better home. We're always wanting to better ourselves. You know, it's, it's funny how people have goals, you know, where we're gonna do this and eventually, I remember I talked to a person, they were, they were my age, this was, well, it was about 10 years ago when I fully retired full-time church, from the church, and a friend of mine bought a house. What a beautiful home. I mean, it was a big house, five bedrooms. It was a nice home. And I said, well, how come you bought a new home? Well, this was always our dream home. 
the one we always wanted, and now we can afford to do it, we'll sell our other house. And, and, and I guess that's all right, but if we're not careful, we want too much. And a lot of times when people are greedy, they're never satisfied. No matter what you give them, they're never satisfied. We are the richest nation in the world, and yet we are a nation that craves things. What they used to say that we, we use like, what, 80% of all consumer goods? I mean, this country really wants them. Proverbs 28, 25 says, A greedy man stirs up trouble, but he who trusts in the Lord will prosper. I think we have to look at our priorities. I guess, if anything, when this is all over the virus, hopefully something good will come of it. And we won't take things so for granted. But you know what? We can't keep wanting things. Things will not buy happiness. And then gluttony is also mentioned in those deadly sins. Proverbs 25, 28 says this. Like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. Now, when we're talking about gluttony, we're not going to get to think about losing weight. You know, everybody wants to lose weight, the New Year's resolution. And then, of course, the, you know, you fast for Lent and lose weight. Let's not get into that weight thing, okay? But gluttony is a lack of self-control. I guess it could be with eating, too. And that kind of sin is dangerous to your own health. Your body needs to stay trim, but you know what? A lot of times we lack self-control when it comes to doing the things of God. And I'll be real honest, as I've thought about this message and sermons for Lent, I thought to myself, you know what? I think I am guilty of spiritual gluttony. You know what? Not in a positive way, but everything else is more important. Like you say, Proverbs says, if you don't have God in control, it's like a city with the walls broken down. In context of that time period, walls protected the city. Without the walls, there was no self-control. Remember Jericho, the walls came tumbling down. Their defenses were gone. To live in this world, we need spiritual defense. And let's be honest, and I'll be honest with you as I stand here before you this, this evening, and that is simply this. All of this gets to me too. I'm not happy with what's going on in our world. There's just things that aren't right. I told somebody the other day was complaining. They were, um, oh, was, I mean, it was, I read this, it was on the news actually. And over in England, they were complaining because it could be two years without a vacation. They wouldn't be on holiday for a while. We're worried about missing a vacation or a cruise. Some people have enough money to have enough food. But I hope we realize that we need to put more dependency upon God. And the last one, number seven, is lust. Lust is a craving for the pleasures of the body, and it can get us in all kinds of trouble. We read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, it is, God, it is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God. This is something that has to be removed. Think about that. We lust after things. We want those things. We want all the things that will bring us pleasure. And not just physical pleasure, but emotional pleasure. We want lots of things when you think about that, you know? Um, we tend to do that. I, I was thinking with my children and grandchildren, like Christmas and stuff, they get a lot more gifts than I got when I was a child. And I think their mother would say the same thing, that she got far less gifts than what we have given children and grandchildren. Well, we have the money to do it, and that's all well and good. But you know what? Be careful of the things that will bring that kind of pleasure. Lust of the pleasures of the body will only be temporary happiness. And then it fades away. Only the things we do for the Lord really matter. We've got to get our act together during this Lenten season. So I conclude by saying this. So what is it in your life that needs to be trimmed? You need a little spiritual trimming. Think about that. This is the Lenten season. And it's usually tradition to give up something for Lent. You frequently hear people give up candy or sweets. Or some special food that they like. As we begin this Lenten season, the first Sunday of Lent is this Sunday, we need to be trimmed, our soul trimmed. Let, let, let be a time of spiritual growth. And I've said this before on a, on a Nash Wednesday service. Instead of being concerned on what we give up, why don't we take up something? 
Why don't we take up the goal of spiritual growth for the Lenten season? And if we do that, when Easter Sunday comes, even if we're not having church services, it can be a great time to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. A lot of thoughts go through my mind. You know, you, you say to yourself, what can I do to grow my faith in the Lord? And we have to do that. But this world is really tough. There's a lot of temptations out there trying to draw us from the Lord. And right now, discouragement is probably the toughest thing people are going through. Pretty soon, on the 15th of March, it'll be a year since we've had a service in the sanctuary with people. And boy, do I miss seeing your faces, folks. I just long for the day when we can once again get up on a Sunday morning and head to the church and ring that bell outside and, 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 and again say, you know, welcome to our service this morning. Well, it takes time and we must be patient. But I hope that uh, uh, this message spoke in your heart and I pray also that, uh, again, it will help you with your Lenten journey. Um, let the Lord lead you and may this be a time, yes, of great spiritual growth, growth as we turn to number 338, where he leads me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Let the Lord lead. 338, Paul. Paul, 338. Where, where he leads me. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take that cross and follow. To, of course, Holy Week, which will be a little different this year, too. But let it be a time not to be discouraged, but to be encouraged. Continue to pray, read your Bible more, and pray that the very Jesus Christ who saves our soul would bring our country together once again. I ask God's richest blessings upon you as we close this service in prayer. Lord Jesus, we now conclude this service for Ash Wednesday, and I just pray for each of our parishioners, our churches, and everyone around us, Lord, that this time of Lent would be a time of real soul searching. Look at our hearts and ask ourselves, is there things that need to change in my life, things that need to be trimmed away, that we may, again, be the Christian we should be, all that we should be. So bless us, Lord, and make us a blessing to others this Lenten season. In your name we pray, amen. God bless you, and again, uh, I, I encourage you, like I say, to... Uh, 
make this time very special quality. God bless you. Thank you very much.